Hello, friends, and thanks for joining me this week. My name is Laura Adams, and I'm a personal finance expert and author who's been hosting the Money Girl podcast since 2008. The mission here, it's pretty simple. It's to help you get the knowledge and motivation to prioritize your finances, build lots of wealth, and have more security and less stress. I create every show sort of like a mini training. It's designed to help you come away with practical advice and tips that will help you make better money decisions and take your financial wellness to the next level. Today's show was inspired by James R., who says, I'm in the process of getting pre-approved for a mortgage to buy my first home, and I see options that include points. What are points, and how can I know if paying for them will help me? James, thank you so much for sending in this question. It's actually been a while since I've podcasted about points, so I'm glad to revisit it. I would tell anybody listening to the show that if you are interested in buying a home, or maybe you just want to understand the pros and cons of mortgage points, maybe you've got a mortgage that you want to refinance, you don't want to miss this episode. No matter if you're in the market to buy a home or you're just considering if a mortgage refinance can help you lock in a lower rate, stay with me. I'm going to cover everything you need to know to choose the best home loan or refinance for your situation. And I'm also going to answer a couple of additional listener questions at the end of the show, so stay with me for those. By the way, if you're enjoying Money Girl, I would love for you to do me a quick favor. Just hit the subscribe button wherever you're getting your podcasts. That will help you get every new episode the moment it's released. And while you're there, if you could leave a rating or review, that is a great way for you to quickly and just for free give back to the show. And I also want to invite you to leave a money question or comment 24-7 on our voicemail line. All you have to do is call 302-364-0308. And you can also email me using the contact page at lauradadams.com. Or maybe you want to connect on Twitter at Laura Adams, on Instagram, at Laura D. Adams, and on the Money Girl Facebook page. All right, let's get into it. If you're like James and you're shopping for a home mortgage or a refinance right now, you have probably seen the term mortgage points. So before you take the next step to sign a mortgage pre-approval or any other borrowing commitment, you need to understand how points work. Taking out a mortgage is a big decision. I mean, it really can impact your finances. So you don't want to miss the opportunity to take advantage of mortgage points when it's wise for your situation. Paying points can definitely help you get the best deal possible on your next new home or refinance. But they're not for everyone. So let's review five things homebuyers should know about mortgage points. All right, the first thing you need to know is why mortgage points can help home buyers. So let's go through it. Mortgage points, they're also known as discount points, reduce the interest rate you have to pay on a loan. Now, while that might sound fantastic, you do have to pay the points up front. We'll talk more about that. And they typically do save you money over time, but we're going to go through the situations when they don't help you. Every mortgage point you buy reduces a loan's annual percentage rate, or APR, by typically 0.25%, so a quarter of a point. So if the original APR is 4.5%, Paying one mortgage point knocks it down to 4.25%. Paying two points would reduce the rate to 4% and so on. So the more points you buy, the lower your interest rate. Here's an example. Let's say you are shopping for a $300,000 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and it's 4.5%. Your total interest rate on that loan would be over $247,000. But if you bought three mortgage points and you got that loan at 3.75%, that would mean just paying interest of $200,165. That's a massive interest savings of more than $47,000 over the life of the loan. 
As you can see, there is a significant advantage to reducing the interest that you have to pay. All right, the second thing you need to know is how much home buyers have to pay for mortgage points. So you're probably thinking, well, Laura, that sounds great, but what do I have to spend up front to get that long-term savings? So one mortgage point typically costs 1% of your home loan amount. So if you want to borrow $300,000 to buy a property, one mortgage point would cost $3,000. And you'd have to pay $6,000 for two points and $9,000 for three points and so on. Most home buyers who opt for points buy between one and three. And you've also got the option to purchase fractions of points. So like 1.5 points or 2.75 points. However, the challenge for most buyers is that lenders typically require you to pay points up front. And since that cost is included in the total amount that you've got to bring to the closing table, you've got to have it in savings. So it means in addition to your down payment and all your other closing costs, you've got to have more money to come to the closing table with. And that can be challenging for a lot of buyers who are sort of stretching their budget to begin with. All right, the third thing you need to know about points are all of the pros for paying them. So as I mentioned, paying a few thousand dollars up front can save you tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. When you get an APR discount that allows you to break even, paying points is worth it. Now I'm going to talk more about breaking even and what that means in just a moment. You also enjoy a reduced monthly payment when you get a lower interest rate on a fixed rate mortgage. So paying points can be an excellent way to keep the cost of a home within budget. For example, if you get a $300,000 30-year fixed rate mortgage at 4.5%, your monthly payment would be about $1,520. But if you bought three points and discounted that rate down to 3.75%, your monthly payment would be $1,389, saving you about $1,500 a year. So in addition to paying less interest and lower monthly payments, mortgage points usually qualify as tax-deductible mortgage interest. And that's important because if you itemize your deductions on Schedule A, that's the schedule that can accompany Form 1040 when you file taxes, you can include a certain amount of mortgage interest. And that includes those prepaid mortgage points to reduce your tax liability. Now, the IRS specifies that if those points are for lender fees, that's not the same as mortgage interest. So it does not qualify as a tax deduction if you're buying mortgage points simply to reduce your origination fee or your lending fee instead of lowering your interest rate. And if you want to go deeper and learn more about mortgage points and how the tax deduction works, you'll find a lot of information on the IRS website. You can even consult with a tax expert, a mortgage lender, or a real estate professional. All right, the fourth thing you need to know about points are the cons. What are the downsides? And as I've mentioned, mortgage points have a whole lot of benefits, but there are definitely cons that you need to consider. As I mentioned, a common challenge is being short on savings and just not being able to afford them. If you borrow $100,000 to buy a home, paying for three points means you need to spend an extra $3,000. And, you know, that's for a very low-priced home in most markets. As I mentioned, if it's a $300,000 loan, three points is $9,000. So it just may be unaffordable. With low inventory, high home prices, and rising interest rates in our current real estate market, Budgets can be stretched thin even for just minimum closing costs without points. So if you don't have the extra funds to pay points and maintain a healthy cash reserve, which is super important, spending the money on points may not be best. Don't forget your monthly payment has four components known as PITI, P-I-T-I. That stands for Principal, Interest, taxes, and insurance. So before you start searching for your dream home, you need to get familiar with what are the typical homeowner's insurance rates where you want to live and plug it into a mortgage calculator to know exactly how much home you can afford. So again, you know, it's not just the mortgage payment. You're talking about 
P-I-T-I is your total monthly outlay, the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. So you need to be able to afford that full pity amount. Another con for paying points that I mentioned is not reaching a break even. And that's the number of months that it takes for your interest savings to exceed the price paid for points. Let me give you an example. If you've got a $200,000 30-year fixed rate mortgage at 4.5%, you'd pay about $1,010 per month. If you paid $2,000 for one point on that loan and you discounted the rate down from 4.5% to 4.25%, that would reduce your monthly payment to $983, which is a $27 per month savings. So to break even, you'd need to make payments for 75 months, which is more than six years, in order to reach that break-even point. And the calculation is $2,000 that you paid for the point divided by your monthly savings of $27 equals 74.1 months. So by the time you hit that 75th month, you're now in the black instead of being in the red. You have more than covered the cost of those upfront points. If you sold the property before living there for 75 months, you lose money. The points would not have been worth it. So if you're not sure how long you'll stay in your home or you think there's a chance that you may need to move before that break-even point, buying points will not help you. Another potential con for mortgage points is buying them right before interest rates go down. Now, that's not the situation that we're in in our current real estate market, but it's just something to consider because the market will eventually change. So if you buy points right before interest rates go down, that would mean you'd already have the ability to refinance for a lower rate without having to pay for the points. So consider the interest rate environment that you're in so that you don't needlessly buy points. But as I mentioned, that's you know not the situation that we're in at the moment. Also, remember that every financial move you make comes with what is called an opportunity cost. That means you could probably do something else with your money and maybe it would give you a better return. For instance, let's say paying 5,000 bucks for points would save $20,000 on your mortgage interest over the life of a loan. But what if you invested that money for 30 years with an average 8% return? that would actually allow you to potentially earn $45,000. That's a whole lot more. It's more than double the interest savings that you would have gotten by buying the points. So it just comes down to how can you use your excess money in a way that's going to give you the highest return? All right, the fifth thing you need to know about points is how to know if it's going to be worth it. While paying mortgage points can save money over the life of a loan, it isn't for every homeowner. So let me sum up. Paying discount points may not make sense if you don't have enough savings. You won't or don't know if you'll remain in a home past the break-even point. You think interest rates will drop soon, or you believe you can earn more by investing your excess cash. When you shop around for a mortgage, you want to watch out for rates that sound too good to be true because they likely include paying points. You maybe will see that down in the very fine print. You want to ask lenders for rates with and without points so that you can make an apples to apples comparison and carefully crunch the numbers to make sure that you're getting the best possible rate and terms for your situation. You can get guidance from one or more mortgage professionals if you're just not sure what type of mortgage is right for you or if you should be discounting it by paying points. James, I hope this helps you choose the best mortgage product as you move forward with your pre-approval. All right, let's talk about a couple of other listener questions that came in. These are related to retirement. Sue P. says, I get such benefit from your easy-to-understand explanations. I'm 68. I work full-time with no intention of retiring for many years. This year, I have to pay income tax. So I'm thinking about contributing to a traditional IRA to avoid this. Being that I would be in a lower tax bracket later on, 
when I need to tap those funds. But how would it affect the requirement to take withdrawals at age 72? And can you still contribute to a traditional IRA after age 72? Thank you. Sue, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're getting a lot of benefit from the show. It means so much to me. So I really like your idea of making a traditional IRA contribution in order to cut your taxes. That's an excellent idea. That's something I do every single year. I want to make sure that my tax liability is as low as possible. And if I can also contribute to a retirement account, and get uh, all those benefits of the growth, tax deferred, then it's a win-win. So the the trick here for you is that if you want to make an IRA contribution for last year, the 2021 tax year, you need to do it by your tax filing deadline. That's either April 18th, 2022, or the date of a tax extension. If you file an extension, you would use IRS Form 4846 to do that. And the extension would give you through October 17, 2022 to make your contribution for last year. Just remember that if you owe money, like you said you do owe money for taxes uh, for 2021, the deadline to pay it is still April 18th. So, What I would recommend is that you act quickly so that you can uh, make that updated tax calculation. And if you need to work with a tax accountant uh, in order to do that, you know, I wouldn't hesitate to lean on a professional for that quick update. And as far as taking withdrawals, um, you do have to start taking withdrawals from a traditional IRA. And that also includes a SEP IRA if you're self-employed or a simple IRA when you reach age 72. Now, if you've got a Roth IRA, they do not require you to take any withdrawals no matter how long you live. So this is only applying to traditional accounts. Those required minimum distributions or RMDs for traditional retirement accounts do get added to your taxable income. So they're not taxed as investment gains. They're actually taxed as ordinary income. Now, the rules have changed so that you can now make contributions to traditional IRAs beyond age 72. You can make those contributions as long as you live. But there's a catch. No matter your age or type of retirement account, you've got to have earned income to contribute. And this is true whether we're talking about a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. So that means you've got to have wages or salary or business income to qualify, not investment income. You know, if you're taking investment income uh, because you're retired, that doesn't count for the purposes of making retirement account contributions. But you mentioned that you plan to work for a long time, so you would probably qualify to make traditional IRA contributions in years after your 72nd birthday, you know, as long as you've got that earned income, even if you're also taking the required minimum distributions. So thank you so much for that question, Sue. I hope that clarifies, and I hope you are able to uh, make that traditional IRA contribution and cut your taxes. All right, we've got another great question that came in from Anna S., who says, love the show. Thank you so much for all your useful and helpful advice each week. I feel like I've learned so much from you. I have a couple of 403Bs from previous jobs that I'm obviously no longer contributing to. I know they exist, so does the fact that I'm not actively doing anything with them mean they're forgotten? should I roll them into my 401k that I have now? Can I even roll over a 403b into a 401k? Are there advantages to having multiple 401ks or 403bs, or is it better to just have everything in one place? Thanks so much, Anna. This is a great question, and I think a lot of people struggle with what they should do with an old retirement account. And, you know, even if you consider it forgotten, it's still your money. You can do whatever you want with them. Um, You can certainly leave them where they are. But you can roll over one or more 403Bs into your current 401k. So you would roll traditional money into traditional accounts or Roth money into a Roth account. So 
I'm going to assume that you've got traditional 403Bs. You can certainly roll them into your traditional 401k. And that's if your current plan allows it. And it would be unusual if it didn't, but you just want to double check. Um, You can talk to your HR benefits person or your plan custodian just to confirm that. And I do think that having your workplace retirement plans in one place allows you to manage the money better. And I think just feel more financially organized. So what's the downside? Well, I don't think there's much of a downside to making this move unless you really, really like the investment options that you're getting in an ex-employer's plan a whole lot more than your current investment menu or the fees are significantly lower with the ex-plan than the current one. But in general, I think the benefits of consolidating your retirement plans outweighs the downsides because most employer plans tend to have similar fees and investments. So I hope that helps. Thanks again to James, Sue, and Anna for your terrific contributions to the show. If you have a money question, visit lauradadams.com where you'll find my contact page and more about me, my books, and online courses. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Until then, here's to living a richer life. Money Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Steve Rukiberg with editing by Adam Cecil. Our advertising operations specialist is Morgan Christensen. Our assistant manager is Emily Miller and our marketing and publicity assistant is Davina Tomlin. 